that's where we met in Yemen some 10 years ago. And uh, it was a bit the last summer before. The last, it was when we were there, it was the first car bombing. And since then, obviously, Yemen's history has been uh, not what it was in the years before then, that's for, for sure. But, uh, you know, whenever I have questions about it, um, violent extremist organizations of the Muslim world, I usually will try and get in touch with Chris because he knows so much about these organizations. So he's a, he's, a, he's a real resource and his work is fascinating. And he hasn't even finished his PhD yet, so he's still he's still a grad student and he already has uh, so many skills and so much knowledge. So I'm glad that he's here to share it with us. And uh, he'll talk for, we have about till 1.30. So you can talk for people. You talk for like 30, minutes, 40 minutes or something, and then we have plenty of time for question and answer. And of course, there's food outside. For those of you who haven't had any yet, welcome. Go okay. Ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to to Jack, to Professor Brown, and to the center for the invitation. Um, so today I'm going to speak about specifically about Al Shabab's media, sort of different media campaigns, media operations campaigns, but and also, but specifically how they link in or how they connect to the overall kind of insurgent. Uh, sort of stra strategic thinking and goal making. Um, so I'll probably alternate between sort of my prepared kind of script and then the PowerPoint. Everything in the PowerPoint images, uh, film clips, everything are primary source materials about which I'll be talking. So I wanted to make sure to include, um, you know, a, a basically only primary materials to sort of uh, illustrate the um, sort of the amount of material that primary material that that Al Shabab uh, produces, and this is this is uh, true with with any sort of number of jihadi organizations, um, ISIS or Islamic State or Daesh or whatever you want to call it, is is sort of a step above. But so just basically, very sort of uh, briefly, an introduction. This is a sort of an overview of of the different sort of topics um, that w that I hope to cover, sort of briefly, uh, succinctly today. Um, just sort of in the introduction, sort of the very beginning to be, uh, Al Shabab, the origins of Al Shabab are, are debated. Some date it back to the to the early 1990s when a sort of a group of young Somali uh, Somalis traveled to Afghanistan and trained at with uh, at Al Farouk, the Al Qaeda training camp in Afghanistan, the main Al Qaeda training camp, and that they came back to Somalia in the 90s and then through the 90s and the early 2000s sort of re-coalesced into the sort of proto, the group that would become Al-Shabaab. Al-Shabaab existed uh, in 2004, 2005 as a, a, the most militant sort of faction within the military wing of uh, an umbrella organization called the Islamic Courts Union, which established, re-established a, a real sense of sort of law and order and, and stability um, following the Civil War, since the Civil War, the first real sort of period of of stability since uh, the Civil War broke out in 1990-91. Um, when Ethiopia invaded in December 2006 with U.S. government's uh, sort of, not permission, but assistance, certainly assistance, intelligence assistance, the the ICU was overthrown and Al-Shabaab by 2007 had reemerged as a fully independent and uh, most lethal of the insurgent rebel groups fighting the Ethiopian occupation forces as well as the African Union forces which were present in Somalia to, to support the, the very weak and the still very weak transitional federal government, the Somali transitional federal government or the TFG. So we're going, the story really begins with Al-Shabaab's media in sort of December 2006 into early 2007, early mid-2007, sort of the early, and it's important to sort of I think keep in, in uh, sort of a mind that when ISIS was still masquerading on paper as a state uh, in 2008, 2007, 8, and 9, when it really did not control any real territory, that al-Shabaab was not only in control of vast amounts of territory in southern and parts of central Somalia, but also was implementing um, a lot of what ISIS is, how we've seen ISIS do since 2013, 2014, al-Shabaab began doing, you know, as early as 2008 when it began capturing vast amounts of territory um, in the south, um, especially important urban and economic hubs like the port city of Kismayo in the far south. The, um, so really, in many ways, al-Shabaab is, is kind of a, a, a path breaker and, and, and also in media, which, which I'll come to in a, in a little bit. So the earliest al-Shabaab films, some of them are 
difficult to say whether they're Al Shabab specifically or sort of sort of proto Shabab films. They're not they're not branded like they are later as being from the media department of of, of Al Shabab. But most of the early films deal with a sort of a set number of kinds of topics. The first one is the recruitment, foreign fighter recruitment particularly. Uh, it's a specific interest very, very early on, and it, it comes back again in 2010 as kind of a, a refocus on recruitment drives. Um, the other focus is reporting on sort of the kind of insurgents, asymmetrical kind of warfare operations that al-Shabaab engaged in beginning in late 2006 uh, into 2007. So, you know, so whether it was ambushes of African Union convoys, attacks on TFG sort of patrols and bases, this kind of thing. They also highlight the corruption of the TFG. So for example, there were a number of very infamous incidents when the TFG's soldiers, which basically were and, and continue to be basically clan-based militias, would loot the merchants in the main market in Mogadishu, the Bakara market. So al-Shabaab used sort of news footage of that in their own media releases, propaganda releases, to show, you know, look, this is what the, the internationally backed government is doing. It's basically not a government, even though it has been given international legitimacy by the international community, by the U.S., by the EU, by the African Union, because basically it allows its you know, it's a government of pillage, and it's a government that basically is, is so corrupt that it, it can't even control its own soldiers. The other thing which comes up very early in al-Shabaab films are sort of international controversies, such as the Danish cartoons of 2005, beginning in 2005. So some of the foreign fighters, like this young man, when they deliver their last messages, their, their last will and testaments in, in some of these um, early films, they talk about the... They basically speak about how they see the things like the Danish cartoon controversy, which they see it as, as kind of exemplary of, of general uh, disrespect for sort of Muslim beliefs and Muslim uh, sort of sensibilities, and they tie that into, you know, and the only way to, to change this is through military, military action, through, through violence. Um, another thing that comes up sort of early in early Shabab films, so these are some of the recruitment stills from some of the early recruitment films. This film, which was uh, a film called Preparations for the No Peace Accepts with Islam campaign, features a number of foreign fighters. This came out in 2008, and even in the very beginning, we see al-Shabaab's sort of interest in attracting a very wide array of different types of foreign fighters. So in this film, there are fighters who speak in Somali, who speak in Swahili, in Urdu, in Arabic, in English, um, and in, I believe in French. Right, so they, and then it's interspersed with sort of footage of uh, training camps and this kind of thing. Something else that Al Shabaab like, and it's not unique in this, I mean, uh, ISIS does this a lot, um, so does al the different Al Qaeda groups, where they take certain segments of the Quran, of course, and they interpret them in a very particular way. So, for example, Al Shabaab and other, other sort of jihadi, Sunni jihadi organizations as well, but Al Shabaab in particular, um, like to, but also the Pakistani Taliban. Um, segments of it, like to reinterpret what the word uh, terrorism means. So they basically, they not only they embrace the, the term terrorism, but they don't define it in the same way as, let's say, Western governments or we would perhaps. So they say basically our terrorism, they, they link it to a, a part of a verse in Surat Al-Anfal, right, in which the, at least in, uh, the believers, the Muslims are said, are instructed to taqibuna bihi adu Allah so terrorize the enemies of God, but they use, it's a longer verse. The verse is longer than this, but they only use this particular part. And then they say, yes, but our terrorism is not the terrorism of, of what the West says, like our terrorism is, is sanctified, and they give a number of reasons for that. So al-Shabaab in 2008, for example, even had a, a major military campaign, which it, it dubbed Irhabuna Mahmoud, our, our terrorism is, is blessed. And they say basically, not only we are instructed to, to terrorize the enemies of God, and basically their definition of enemy is what's very, very broad, uh, whereas I think a more, you know, a more mainstream interpretation of the research would say that it's, it's linked to a specific time and place. So here we see just probably the most famous of al-Shabaab's foreign fighters on the right, Omar Hamami, an American from Alabama. Um, he traveled to Somalia in 2006 from Egypt, and he joined actually one of the militias attached to the 
Islamic Courts Union. Eventually, he, he ends up, he moves over to al-Shabaab training camps before the Ethiopian invasion. And then following the Ethiopian invasion and the fall of the ICU, he emerges as a very public figure, media personality, I would call him, within al-Shabaab. Um, his story is a very interesting one. He, just very briefly, in 2012, he has a major falling out. The exact details are unclear. Al-Shabaab, it's from uh, never really detailed what they were. According to Hamami, they were differences over Sharia and strategy. Those are his exact words. He didn't. He elaborated a little bit, and basically, what it seems is that Al-Shabaab for him, under its Amir Ahmed Godane, was not global enough. He said that basically Godane and the majority of Al-Shabaab sort of leaders and bureaucrats um, who, who sided with Godane. Um, were too parochial and too focused on Somalia, and they were not truly global. So he wrote a number of um, sort of interesting but quite tedious um, strategic guides under the sort of nom de guerre or, or, or pen name of Abu Jihad al-Shami, um, which I, I read through for a, thing that, a piece that I wrote many, a number of years ago. Um, the last one was on Syria. Um, what's interesting to see is sort of see how he what he approaches, one of his guides is a military guide, I forget the title offhand, but basically he, not plagiarizes because he does, he does cite them, but he takes whole cloth, large parts of American military, um, basically training guides, and then intersperses, the, he tries to Islamize them with his own commentary. He, he literally takes huge, parag I mean, multiple paragraphs, puts them in, adds his own commentary, puts multiple, uh, you know, um, cuts and pastes multiple paragraphs again and tries to, uh, and he says, look, even though these are not these are from non-Muslim sources, they have many things which are useful and I'm going to try to put them in the proper context. So, you know, basically Islamizing to him is trying to link them to sort of various historic battles um, of the Prophet Muhammad uh, and other sort of, compa of his companions. So wh why, you know, why why would it go? Why would Al Shabaab sort of focus on both a sort of a, a global aspect or a transnational aspect, as well as a, a Somalia-centric, uh, you know, aspect in terms of recruitment? One of the things that its media campaign, having a more sort of transnational or globalized media sort of recruitment pitch, was that it was able to outperform some of its domestic competitors. There were, you know, Al Shabaab in 2007 to 2010 was not the only. Um, rebel group operating in the country. There were a number of groups which were against the TFG, including the largest was a coalition of clan-based uh, Islamist militias called Hezbollah Islam. But Hezbollah Islam was, uh, was suffered from two things. One, it was not a truly unified group. It was made up of four clan-based militias. And that its, its recruitment pitches were based, it, it really did not try to recruit sort of pan-clan or outside of the country. So each militia came from a specific uh, drew its manpower from a specific clan. So Al-Shabaab was able to outpace them and ultimately subdue them in infighting in 2010. So one of, this, one of the ways that this kind of sort of globalized or global, uh, globalizing kind of recruitment pitches or recruitment pitch uh, benefited Al-Shabaab was it was able to outperform and outrecruit and out, also out, um, not fund, out um, collect more funds from the diaspora. So I want to turn a little bit to sort of the, and this is just again some of the things from Al Shabaab recruitment films. And actually, this gentleman from Sweden talks about uh, Lars Vilks, one of the other um, cartoonists, uh, when he's talking to fellow Swedes to come to Somalia to sort of uh, defend the honor of their religion. Uh, turning o sort of to the, the idea of what is, what did Al Shabaab try to do in 2008, 2009 when it began capturing large amounts of territory? So the first thing that it was interested in doing was to prov uh, project an image of itself that was very different from the sort of inept and very corrupt TFG, and it wanted to say basically we are um, an alternative, not only sort of religiously or ideologically more legitimate because of our you know, Islamic so-called uh, authenticity, but also that we can actually get things to work in a much better way than the, the internationally backed government. So one way that it did that was to institute a kind of law and order, or a harsh, a f certainly a very harsh form of law and order, but one which basically, even though Al-Shabaab sort of took over as the, the, the sort of t the group which would, uh, predatory group which would tax and would implement certain things, it was still an improvement to many local 
locals over having to pay, for example, you know, five different militias. To, if you were going from this part of the city of Beidoa to the other part of the city of Beidoa, you had to pay. The city was divided among you know three, four, five different militias. You had to pay road taxes three, four, or five times. So with Al Shabab, you paid one. To the point of, and I have a colleague, uh, Aisha Ahmed at the University of Toronto, who works on um, sort of the business uh, community support, specifically in Somalia and in Afghanistan and Pakistan, to certain forms of rebel Islamist rebel organizations, including Al Shabab and the Islamic Courts, because the Islamic Courts and Al Shabab even have they don't just extort money; they actually do have formed relationships with certain merchants and business people, particularly when they controlled the coast in uh, coastal cities of Kismayo and Marka. So for example, the charcoal trade, the illegal charcoal trade, which is um, until, at least until 2014 when they lost the last port, was a very important, upwards of 100 to $120 million a year, mostly uh, smuggling charcoal from Somalia to the Gulf, Gulf countries. And a lot of the businessmen, some of the biggest ones who were smugglers of charcoal, have very, had at least very close relationships with Al-Shabaab. So as part of the kind of law and order aspect or the insurgent justice, if, you want to, if we want to think of it that way, is, you know, it's uh, you know, per certainly their interpretation of Sharia of Islamic law and Islamic jurisprudence is very, very narrow. It's basically the hadud. It's basically this, this, uh, the set punishments for certain crimes. Very interestingly, and it's something that I'm working on in my dissertation, is that when in 2008, it, it literally one of the first things it, d it does when it takes over these major economic hubs like Beidoa and Marka and Kismayo is they go to the public square, they gather sort of uh, the public, and they make very clear public announcements of th that there is a new sort of regime, a new sort of system of, of law and order in the city, or in the town. And the crimes that they specifically identified, uh, some of them are moral crimes, things like zina, things like um, you know, uh, the Sufi shrines, things that they don't like, the Italia, cemetery of Italian soldiers killed in World War I. Um, but the, the, the bulk of the offenses which they say will be no longer tolerated and which they will be targeting are economic crimes. So highway robbery, hiraba, theft, uh, sort of wanton kind of killing, this kind of thing. And it's something that they highlight later on in terms of that they, particularly when they're losing these areas of, you know, when, remember when we came in, we instituted this, implemented this form of law and order and justice, um, compared, certainly compared to the, the federal government, the, the TFG, which did not do it. When it really began being pushed back in 2011, and sort of cognizant of the fact that there were, that one of the problems with al-Shabaab is there is somewhat of a decentralization among aspects of its local bureaucracies. So certain, so we read about, for example, I mean, some of the stories are just false, like they banned samosas because they look like they have the Trinity or something, I saw that story, I mean, that was false. But some of the things that were implemented, for, such as the banning of cot in one area would not be banned in another area. It would depend on the commander in that particular area. Cognizant of the fact that there were complaints by locals um, against some of their officials, they opened in 2011 the Mazalam courts. Um, to basically uh, first in middle and lower Shibala, two regions south of Mogadishu, and then spreading to other regions that they controlled. Basically, and the idea of the, the Mazalam court, which Professor Brown can talk much more about, um, is it historical? Basically, in theory, it's where the, even the sultans or the rulers, um, officials can be held to account for various sort of infractions or abuses of sort of the everyday population, you know, the, the sort of general population. This is a, from one of the Mazalim courts, the top left, uh, one of the hearings. And so one of the other things beyond media, beyond you know, films, beyond audio messages, beyond photography of Al-Shabaab's that I would classify, that, that I classify as part of um, Al-Shabaab's media campaign overall is the, choreo the, the organizing, choreographing, uh, and the holding of public events. If we think about, I mean, really any I, mean, I guess really any government, but you know, particularly if you think uh, if we think of uh, probably the most famous or infamous would be, you know, Albert Speer and and, and Lenny Riefenstahl, the kind of organization of these very sort of highly choreographed events and film meant, you know, meant for filming basically. So these are some of them. One of this one is a graduation of of preachers of of uh, individual preachers from mosques and sort of among fighting units um, in 2010. Uh, it's named after Abdullah Azam, the famous uh, Afghan, quote unquote, Afghan Arab commander, recruiter, fundraiser. And this is Ali, uh, Ali Arage, who's the, um, still the senior spokesman for Shabab. 
So this is kind of one of the events, sort of, uh, what kind of events do they do? Basically the, the Friday prayers, but particularly the Eid, or Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha, uh, just recently, for example, in all of the regions that they control, particularly in urban areas, but also in the countryside, they, Al-Shabaab's um, sort of uh, main bureaucrats, uh, sort of the governors of all the regions and some of its sort of senior leaders will host these kind of events, other celebrations as well, not just the Eids, but the Eids are particularly important for them. And they basically, they record them. They sometimes release them to in films or other kinds of releases which are aimed externally, but the bulk of the reporting and the kind of documenting of these is actually aimed at a domestic audience and is only done in, in Somali, like to a Somali audience, not, not to externally. It's the same from some Eid prayers. So what happens in, two, in February 2011 when the African Union, the Somali governments, uh, and sort of allied militias, and then eventually Kenya and Ethiopia again, sort of begin a series of sort of re, uh, new offensives against al-Shabaab, which really pushed them out of Mogadishu, out of most of the, the urban centers. How does, al how does that affect al-Shabaab's media, and how does al-Shabaab's media uh, react? So basically, during the times of um, decline, there is a slowdown in releases. Uh, just one quick example is al-Shabaab, and it's at its height in 2009 to f about February 2011, issued daily um, news reports, communicate written news reports. This eventually slows to weekly, to monthly, and now um, it stopped for a period uh, entirely, and now it's, they're issued monthly. But there, used, there was a time when they were released d literally daily, sort of, and they're very brief, and they just are mostly about military operations generally, or social events, this kind of thing. However, the sort of the quality in terms of the production value, things like this, particularly for films, does not decrease, and if anything, it actually increases during this time. The, the number of films specifically slows down. The number of photo, photogra you know, photographs, things like official photography, things like this, does not. And one of the things that doesn't get as much attention as the films for sort of jihadi organizations generally are, is photography. So if we take ISIS, ISIS just since June, May, June 2014 has released by my count, and I haven't even been able to collect everything, I'd say I have maybe 85%, is upwards of 60,000 photographs of different things. And so if the ones I'd miss, it probably would go up another probably 10 or 20, I would, I would imagine. So, and that's just since, that's just basically since they swept across, you know, Western Iraq. That's not even since the beginning. It, it is true, though, that earlier on, photography was not such a major part, uh, not, not such a, so, so important to their media campaigns. The other thing that Al-Shabaab did, I like this photo, these are Al-Shabaab sort of women. They actually do recruit and train women, sort of women's brigades. Um, during the famine in 2011, they, on the, sort of in reality, they basically prevented a lot of aid from reaching areas in Somalia that were affected. So to try to, count, to, try to counterbalance the negative PR of that, they opened, they publicized, they attempted to publicize and sort of brag about their own, you know, drought relief efforts, basically. And they opened their own temporary internal re refugee camp called Al Yasser in Lower Shabela, which is south of Mogadishu. Um, and they kind of really produced a lot of material, films, photography, reports on the kind of humanitarian, various forms of humanitarian aid that they were, you know, delivering to segments of the affected population. In reality, they, they really prevented a lot of, um, relief from reaching, for example, they banned the, the Red Cross just sort of, and the various UN organizations sort of completely from, from operating in their areas. Um, this is just some of the events kind of things. There, this was a radio contest or a Quran recitation contest in 2010, and the winner won various things, including a Kalashnikov and money. They talk about the Cubs. This is something the the, the Ashbal. Um, this is something that ISIS does as well. Basically, the ideological military sort of physical training of the next generation. What they see is the next generation of uh, fighters. Um, this would have happened probably at one of the Eids. Uh, yeah, at one of the Eid ceremonies. Um, and often these are these are sons and sometimes daughters of uh, existing members. They are. They also like, as a way of attacking the governments, like to highlight the defections at various times, which are fairly regular, of 
government uh, soldiers and sort of police, uh, such as these four gentlemen. So this is a public. This is at their internal, at the Al Yasser sort of internal refugee camp. The guy, this man on the right, Abu Abdullah Al Muhajjar, supposedly was a representative from Al Qaeda who was delivering humanitarian aid to Ali Rage, the spokesman, Shabab spokesman, at Al Yasser during the famine, like as a gift for the the Somalis. It was a sort of a big PR event for them. This is one of the segments from one of the statements about the kind of control that al-Shabaab at its height in 2010, um, yeah, 2010, attempted to, or in fact did, uh, exercise over various sort of external um, aid organizations. The WFP, though, is particularly interesting. There have been criticisms, including from the UN uh, group, the monitoring group for Somalia at the time, and it's, I believe it's 2010 report, 12 report, about sort of the ineptness of some of the WFP's programming uh, programs in Somalia in terms of like some of the food would, would be already have rotted by the time it was delivered. And there were complaints from Somali farmers, not just those that were uh, affiliated or sort of pro-Shabaab, that the, the sort of dumping at certain times of, and it even mentions it here, uh, of food on the market created a glut which harmed, actually harmed sort of domestic uh, local Somali farmers. So a lot of Somali farmers uh, have, have a lot of uh, complaints about the WFP or had them at the time. So they use uh, the cartoons I mentioned. Um, they also use him. They were probably the first, I think, before ISIS used an image of him. This is from a Shabab film. They used, uh, they're very in tune with international kind of events. Also in 2010, if you remember this preacher from Florida, Terry Jones, who talked about said he was going to burn the Quran like they, Shabab talked about him as well. So they, they talk about Trump as well. He's, he's uh, and then ISIS does as well too. I just like that quote from his doctor. But. Um, so this, how did, this is how they sort of mass setbacks. They really in 2011, 2012 begin to uh, tap into a very extensive uh, library of footage to sort of claim that, you know, when we've lost these territories now, but you remember when we controlled them, things were much better than they are now that they've been liberated by the government and by the African Union. Because now the, the sort of clan warlords have come back, and when we were there, the clan warlords were subdued and suppressed, and, and it's because, of course, they say it's because of our implementation of this certain form of law. Another thing that they try to do, have tried to do since then, is, is uh, project an image of power, and of course they have they have a significant presence in Kenya, so they, um, and also the capturing of various sort of African Union equipment and supplies. These are just two examples. So even though we've been pushed back from Beidoua, from Kismayo, from Mogadishu, we still have a very significant presence. And since Kenya invaded in 2012, or in 2011, sorry, that we also have a presence now in Kenya. And they really talk about and they benefit from Kenya's, um, the problems uh, between that many sort of young and the, the disenfranchisement that many young uh, Kenyan Muslims feel, which I'll turn to in a moment. Um, also, they meet with clan elders, unlike ISIS, even though ISIS does meet with sort of disaffected uh, tribes and clans as well. Al-Shabaab, I would argue, is much more in tune with local concerns. So for example, even today, when the federal government alienates certain clans or sub-clans, they, they know that they can go to Shabaab and, and try to get sort of a um, a remedy that's more to their taste. And here they also highlight, these are some of the martyrs from battles, that they highlight which clan or sub-clan that they come from, which is interesting considering that supposedly al-Shabaab, if we were to believe it, is has a very um, Islamic and not a very, you know, th that it privileges its religious identity over everything. That's not always the case. There's a refocusing on martyrdom, on, on they come out with and have and continue to come out with a number of sort of, again, this vast library of footage that they, they must have had for a number of years but haven't released of various uh, fighters who were killed in action um, as far back as, you know, 2008. And kind of a, a vast amount of, of film releases focusing on the ideas of self-sacrifice um, and that self-sacrifice is necessary in order to win victory. This is the former Amir, uh, who is, was killed in September 2014 in a drone strike. Ahmed Goudani or Mukhtar Abu al -Zubair. So the regional media strategy, even though Al-Shabaab's Western foreign fighters from Europe, from Australia, from North America, particularly, you know, the 40 or so young men from 
from Minneapolis, from Portland, from, from other areas who've gone from Toronto, um, yet the most have gotten the most attention. The, the vast um, the majority of foreign fighters for Al Shabaab have always come from East Africa, you know, in the hundreds. And this makes sense just from a logistical point of view. It's much easier to get from Tanzania or Kenya or the Ogaden region in Ethiopia to Somalia, which is right next door, than it is to travel all the way from Sweden, from Britain, from North America, particularly after, you know, 2010, 11, when uh, law enforcement agencies in these countries became very aware that people were, uh, some young people were trying to go to Somalia. So since 2012, Al-Shabaab's recruitment pitches have turned very, very heavily toward um, East African foreign fighters, and particularly those from Kenya. And we see this in the either production of, of materials entirely in, in Swahili or which are in, among other languages, in Swahili. This is Ali Rage, the, the spokesman making a recruitment pitch. A foreign fighter from Kenya showing uh, Ghanima, or sort of war booty, which was captured in an attack on Somali militias in El Wak, in western Somalia, allied to Kenya. Because both Kenya and Ethiopia rely on sort of client Somali militias, both in their country and across the border. The man who's at the center of uh, East Af Al Shabaab's East Af sort of Kenyan recruitment is this man, Ahmad Iman Ali. He was, um, he is the head of a group called the Muslim Youth Center, or Al Hijra, the origins of which are in 2008, 2009, it formed in the Majengo neighborhood area of Nairobi. It was uh, an organization, a sort of a communal organization for Muslim youth. Um, this is a picture of him on the top left when he was uh, still in Nairobi. Um, it was meant to be kind of like a, um, a boys club, I guess. Eventually by 2006, how, uh, sorry, by 2009, 10, they were sending, it seems, fighters to Somalia. And by 2011, 2012, uh, Iman Ali himself relocates from from uh, Kenya to Somalia, where he is the head of the Al Hijra MYC sort of Kenyan contingent, um, and he's increasingly featured in, in Al Shabaab recruitment uh, sort of pitches toward uh, Kenyan youth. Um, their recruitment centers on uh, sort of spiritually on a number of late sort of preachers who were killed in mysterious circumstances. Um, one of them is Abu Drogo. This is a short clip. Um, the genocidal regime set out on an organized policy of ethnic cleansing across the region, killing the Muslim men and raping the remaining Muslim women. And as such, the region has faced decades of violent crackdowns and repressive policies which were imposed by the Kenyan government in order to destroy the identity of the Muslims of the Northern Frontier District. The intense feelings of hate nurtured by such policies have been festering over the decades. <laughs> Leo Taona, Mpaka Una Oshukiwa, Mpaka Una Odulumiwa, Nimakua Kutoka Somalia, Wa Somalia de Odulumiwa, Mara Siwa Kenya. Mara si hivi na ambapo kuna mipaka mingine ukiona mipaka ya Malaba wako wa baluya wa Uganda wako wa baluya wa Kenya lakini huwezi kusikia watu wa kule wa Taifa mara kwa kutambulisho maalumu mara nyisi wa Kenya lakini kwa sababu hawa ni waislamu ndio dhulma inapoendelea na tuambiwa subirini subiri wallahi tungekuwa wanaume tusingeshikwa hivi tunaposhikwa hii ni dhulma so Rogo and a number of other preachers, Abu Bakr Makaburi and Samir Khan Noseba uh, are two others, were killed. Uh, Rogo was, was and Makaburi were gunned down in broad daylight by unknown parties. Um, Shabab, but other groups, uh, including human rights organizations, um, have blamed and, and suspect the, the anti-terror uni terrorism units of the Kenyan police force, which are have been accused of carrying out extrajudicial killings. Al Jazeera English actually did a very good um, documentary on, or I think two maybe actually, on on extrajudicial killings in Kenya. So these killings, and then Samir Khan Noseba was kidnapped, and he was found later in a sort of a, na a park, a nature reserve, uh, you know, with his hands handcuffed behind his back, and he had been shot. Right. So, but but Rogo and Makaburi were were lit Rogo was killed either on the steps of a courthouse as he was leaving, or right near uh, sort of a, a public courthouse in broad daylight in the middle of the day. So, and we know 
it's clear that this resonates with a lot of the Kenyan foreign fighters, not the just this gentleman, but this is an example, basically because they talk about them and they cite them as, as, as one example of this is how, even though the, you know, we're Kenyan citizens, that we are, we're not respected. Basically, they kill our, our, our religious leaders and our, our preachers sort of with, you know, wants and it's sort of abandoned. They can just kill them on the street and we, and they, you, we can't do anything about it and they know that. And this was actually after uh, an ambush on Kenyan, uh, Kenyan police inside of Kenya by al-Shabaab uh, units. This is Ahmed Iman Ali. So turning sort of how, how do, I, I, I say that I would argue that al-Shabaab engages in a form of kind of messaging, a kind of a journalistic or kind of jihadi, like to pose kind of a jihadi kind of journalism is what I call it basically. And what they want to do is sort of uh, twofold. One is to, con to say that we are a more reliable source of information than uh, this is to external audience in Kenya, uh, audiences in Kenya and Uganda than your own governments. So there was a major attack in January of this year at Al Ade, which was a major Kenyan Amazon base in western Somalia in the Gedo region. It was overrun in a mass attack by Al Shabaab, hundreds of Al Shabaab fighters. Um, initially, the Kenyan government uh, and Al Shabaab from the beginning claimed, first it claimed 46, and then eventually 100 plus killed and or captured. The Kenyan government has, I believe, still is maintaining that it was uh, four, no more than 40. But there was a, a major CNN uh, online, CNN online report, for example, that, that supports the higher number of, of even higher than 101, 101 up to 140 uh, Kenyan soldiers were either killed or captured. So in one of the messages, there were a number of them, but in one of the film messages aimed directly at a Kenyan audience, Ali, this is a quote from, from sort of a much longer video, basically, you know, he says, this rifle that I'm holding, the M16, is, uh, is, was from a, a Kenyan soldier, so-and-so. You know, this jacket was from a soldier. Here's his ID card. So if you, you know, families of Kenyan soldiers who are wondering about uh, you know, their fates, you know, don't bother asking our own government because they're just going to lie to you because they were, they're already lying to you now that you know, basically they're trying to say that only you know, 40 were killed. In reality, 100 were killed. This is mirrors something that they've done before a number of times. A major time was in 2011. Outside of Mogadishu in a district called Denile, they ambushed a Burundian Amasam convoy. They killed, they claimed the numbers are disputed, but again, it was Shabab claimed upwards of 70, and the African Union said 10. But reporting from sort of locals, interviewing locals from the New York Times, from Jean France Press, um, supports a higher number, maybe not as high as Shabab is claiming, because then their numbers move up from 70. But Shabab then displays the bodies of the soldiers that were killed. They show ID cards, things like that. And even though they didn't show 76, I think is the number they first claimed, they did show many more than 10. So the, 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 the idea was the same. Uh, just the last example is the, before the Kampala bombings in 2010, there was a Shabab film. They introduced their, an English narrator, a British English narrator. And in the first film, which comes out a month before the Kampala bombings, he, addressing the Ugandan specifically and then Burundian to a lesser extent public, says, says basically you should convince your governments and pressure your governments to leave Somalia. Why are you in, why are your forces in, why are your sons in Somalia? Why are they in Mogadishu? Why are they dying here? They have no interest here. Uh, you know, Ugandans, wouldn't it be better that your, your soldiers defend you from Joseph Kony I mean, he, and, and his army? And if you don't, then, you know, I'm afraid that something, uh, you, you will regret it when it's too late. A month after the Kampala attacks, there's a, a follow-up film, if you can say, with the same narrator who appears on film for the first time. And he basically says, we warned you that you should pressure your governments to leave. And, um, you know, and since you didn't heed our call, this is what happened. They do a whole kind of thing on Kampala. And then they, they try to brand it. There's a, I don't have a, a clip of it, but at the end, there's another scene of where the African Union, they, they accuse them of lying to their own sort of people. And then they destroy an Amazon tank. It's in a ditch in Mogadishu. There's the narrator. He's standing with his hand on the gun turret. And he says, you know, this is, uh, you know, I'm reporting from the front lines. And, uh, and then he closes it as if he's a, an actual news reporter. And some of the messaging, which is aimed externally particularly. And this was after the Westgate Mall siege. And this is Ali Rage after the day Nile. He's holding up a, a rosary from one of the Burundian troops. So this is their kind of journalism. When they rebrand their media organization in 2010, one of them, they do it basically and they try to make it appear as an ad, even through the name of trying to make it appear as an actual news 
organization. Sort of moving to Westgate, they, the whole, the film that they release on Westgate, which is about an hour and a half, the first 30 minutes of it, uh, if we were to take it apart, sort of separate it from the rest of the film, comes, appears to be like a documentary, and they talk all about historical things, about why is it that the, the Northeast province, the Northeast frontier province, which is uh, many, many of its counties are Somali, ethnically Somali majority, why are they in Kenya and not in Somalia? You talk about British colonialism, because this is really why that, 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 that's the case. And then they talk about various kinds of um, historical events, such as the Wagala massacre in 1984, I believe, when uh, sort of ethnic Somalis uh, were the, uh, the target of sort of government's repression after, uh, usually after sort of mass protests. So they interview, and they actually take footage from other sources, and they mesh it together in this kind of sort of a documentary-esque kind of film. Uh, this is from the same film, but then they move into sort of their own justifications. This is from the, the audio message that claimed from Godane that claimed the Westgate attack. Um, some of you may remember during Westgate that before ISIS, really, it was al-Shabaab that really sort of pushed the envelope forward of jihadi use of Twitter. So they did this particularly, they started before Westgate, but particularly during Westgate, they basically live tweeted the attack. They were in contact with, uh, and in this film they released audio from it, with the attackers inside the mall. And they really used it, they took advantage though, uh, they would not have been as successful if not for the Kenyan government's kind of ineptness. So basically there was a lot of confusion and infighting among different Kenyan agencies, the army and the police for example, about how to respond initially to the Westgate attack. And then they made all sorts of claims on the basis of no evidence, for example, that there were you know, uh, a dozen or more attackers. In the end, there seemed to be four to six. Also, they said they claimed that the attack was over. And then by then, the international news media was all in Nairobi. And you could still hear gunfire and see smoke and hear explosions. And it was clear that the attack was not over. And on its sort of live, on its um, Twitter feeds, uh, Shabab would point this out in real time. And they were being shut down repeatedly, but they kept opening them up under variations of the same name. Eventually, Twitter actually, the administration administrators um, banned HSM Press at all because they just kept coming back as HSM Press, you know, 6, HMS, this one, whichever this one is, HSM Press office, variations of HSM Press. And eventually, they, they banned a whole bunch of these kind of Twitter handles. Another way that they, sort of a good example of how they manipulate the media, they're very attuned at what's going to get attention, particularly during times of decline, is by talking about issues which are of concern particularly to Western governments, like this, the fear about lone wolves. We see that with ISIS, where ISIS basically claims every attack everywhere, whether it had any ties to it or not, with some generic claim that, for example, the, the, the attack, this uh, stabbing uh, attacks in the mall in Minnesota, in Minnesota they said is a soldier of the Islamic State. In some cases, they seem to have some prior contact. In some cases, they have none. Orlando, et cetera. So Al-Shabaab does this. In, in the, the Westgate video, there's a minute of it, literally a minute, no more, where they talk about, look, you know, Westgate was successful. You know, Western Muslims in Canada, in Australia, in, in the US, you can uh, carry out a very uh, similar attack. And they name some malls in Edmonton, the Mall of America. Um, you know, some in the UK. So this one minute clip then resulted in this deluge of sort of media coverage of Al-Shabaab calls for attacks in Western walls, which is not untrue, but really is n not the main thing that they're talking about. And this is uh, an example, and Al-Qaeda, they're not, not unique in this, Al-Qaeda has done this as well. This is just two examples. This is first is Shabaab and the other is al -Qaeda. <laughs> Quite understandably, it may not always be easy for every single Muslim in the West to make this momentous journey to the training camps of Jihad. So if it's impossible for you to make it safely to any of the lands of Jihad, then follow the example of your brothers in Village, Toulouse, Texas and Boston. Let not the fear of intelligence agencies or the police divert you from your goal. They can neither benefit you nor harm you, nor do they have the power over life or death. Do not waste your time trying to reinvent the wheel. If you cannot afford to obtain one of these, then certainly a simple knife from your local b and will do the job. So prepare yourself and march forth with firmness and conviction in the rewards of martyrdom. And remember, 
you have this mighty pillar, the pillar of jihad, the banner of Tawheed will never be raised, and the disbelievers will continue to dominate both our lives and our lands. So make your choice today and put your trust in Allah. Muslims in the West have to remember that they are perfectly placed to play an important and decisive part in the jihad against the Zionists and Crusaders, and to do major damage to the enemies of Islam, waging war on their religion, sacred places, and things, and brethren. This is a golden opportunity, and a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the way to show one's appreciation and thanks for this blessing is to rush to discharge one's duty to his ummah and fight on its behalf with everything at his disposal. And in, the, and in the West, you've got a lot at your disposal. Let's take America as an example. America is absolutely awash with easily obtainable firearms. You can go down to a gun show at the local convention center and come away with a fully automatic assault rifle without a background check and most likely without having to show an identification card. So what are you waiting for? That's Adam Gadan, yeah. He's dead, yeah, he's dead like now. like a fundraiser on TV or Yeah, he's, he was actually, people made fun of him, analysts, because of his tedious, tedious. And then closing just about how has Al-Shabaab dealt with internal dissent. Uh, the main example ongoing right now is Al-Shabaab versus uh, ISIS, Islamic State and uh, sort of pro-ISIS uh, elements in Somalia. Um, it earlier it dealt with dissent in 2012 with Omar Hamami, Hamami and other, including some founding uh, members and leaders of Al-Shabaab, um, defected from, from the organization and began to criticize Godane. Eventually, Godane and his, his supporters were victorious. They, they ended up killing a number, Hamami and a number of their most prominent critics. They tend to favor being very low-key. They did not really address in their media directly the Hamami issue. They kind of talked about the need for unity and, and avoiding fitna and this kind of stuff, sort of internal sort of strife. And they've done this with ISIS as well. They've warned that no internal dissent will be tolerated, but they haven't really directly and repeatedly talked about ISIS specifically. They kind of allude more than talk to. Um, ISIS, for their part, beginning in May of, of, of last year, have been not subtle at all. They've released a number of films, but starting in May 2015, continuing into early this year, of basically featuring foreign fighters, first mostly from Somalia, from, from Ethiopia, from East Africa, pitching recruitments to, uh, you know, to defection to existing members of Shabab and, and the Shabab leadership. And then when that became, it became clear that that wasn't going to happen en masse. They began, and Al-Shabaab began uh, cracking down on dissidents. They began releasing warnings against Shabaab that you will, you know, you're going to be held a, in, you know, to account by us and then in the afterlife for, for persecuting, uh, you know, these, these Muslims. And so this is from one of the, the first sort of Shabaab, uh, sorry, uh, ISIS pitch um, to Shabaab members and sort of Shabaab supporters. The only, the, the, so far at least, the main victory for Sir ISIS has been the defection of this gentleman above, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Mu'min, who's a very prominent, uh, he was a prominent Shabab sort of uh, spiritual religious figure, um, fairly prominent uh, Somali Salafi preacher and, and, and um, religious scholar from, from, uh, from Puntland. Um, he was very important to Al-Shabaab's kind of sort of ideological kind of component of its, of its missionary da'wah kind of campaigns. He defected in October 2015 with a number of his followers. It's unclear how many. They didn't specify. Um, there was also this commander, Abu Nu'man al-Yantari. He was promptly uh, killed, uh, located and killed by al-Shabaab's very formidable internal security apparatus, which, which they call the Amniyat. Um, this is a film that they released posthumously of him and about 20 or so of his um, fighters, of his followers, um, giving bay'ah to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. This is a much more recent film from just a week ago of, of pro-ISIS uh, Somali fighters uh, somewhere in Somalia. Abdul Qadir Mu'min is somewhere in the front, uh, and this is the Eid al-Adha, uh, the prayer to greet Eid al-Adha. And sort of, fine, sort of closing, the Al-Shabaab media has, again, very subtly without directly, bluntly addressing sort of the, the very severe infighting between, between ISIS and Al-Qaeda, has reaffirmed um, and, and sort of steadily and continually its loyalty to Ayman al-Zawahiri as, um, as its Amir, as well as here shortly after uh,
public, it was publicly uh, acknowledged by the Taliban that the Afghan Taliban that uh, Mullah Omar had, had died in 2013. They reaffirm uh, their loyalty to him as Amir al Mu'mineen. So if uh, Mullah Omar and then Mullah Akhtar, Muhammad, uh, Muhammad Akhtar, um, Akhtar Mansour, the one who was killed, and then the one now, Haybatullah um, Akhun Zada. If they're Amir al Mu'mineen, then Abu Bakr al Baghdadi cannot be Amir al Mu'mineen. And they acknowledge these two as. Amir al Mu'mineen. Shabab even had janazah prayers for Mullah Omar when it became publicly sort of known that he had died. Um, and just in conclusion, there are a lot of similarities between, of course, different, you know, between Shabab and ISIS. There are significant differences. One, I think, is that, as I mentioned before, that Shabab is much more locally um, rooted than, than ISIS is in many cases. Ideologically, it, it becomes somewhat harder to tell. This is um, from a Shabab film where the president, the current president of, of Somalia, Hassan uh, Sheikh Mahmoud, um, it's, it's all about unbelief and that you have to reject unbelief. This is a quote from Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab from his three foundational principles about what is Islam. Islam is the surrender, complete surrender to this concept of tawhid, the absolute monotheism and rejection of shirk and everybody who associates it with it. I think the imagery is quite clear of uh, President Mahmoud meeting with uh, Secretary Kerry. And with that, I'll close. And if anyone has any questions that come up later, I'm happy to answer them. And thank you very much for listening and coming.